Hey everybody, it's Eric from Barrel and Hatchet, and thank you for checking out another Hatchet Cast episode. And today is an extremely special episode. Um, we're gonna get into some really, really cool stuff with our guest. Um, our guest name is Mike, and um, it's gonna be very, very interesting. I'm super excited for this. So before we get started, make sure you guys hit the subscribe button on on the podcast. As we are watching this on the YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe as well. Hit the notification bell so you get updates about new episodes that drop, as well as um, comment your thoughts on the episode below and what you would actually like for us to talk about or interview people about um, on future episodes. So without further ado, Mike, welcome. Thanks, Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, man. Appreciate it. Um, so just, if you can, just give a quick background on yourself as, as, as much as you're able to elaborate on. Yeah, how far you want me to go back? <laughs> <laughs> when I was born. Yeah, no. I'm an old guy, I yeah, guess. Yeah. Um, well, I guess starting from military as a Marine Corps services um, for four years. And then uh, after leaving, and by the way, that was during a peacetime era. So nothing spectacular to talk about with that. Um, gave me a good foundation. I always wanted to join the Marine Corps, but as soon as I got in, I really wanted to get out you know, right. and do other things. Um, migrated over into law enforcement. So worked for a uh, Florida law enforcement agency for about eight years. But about six years into that, um, you know, I, I already saw myself kind of going and moving on to other things. About year two into law enforcement, I got into like working narcotics and gang units, SWAT, that kind of thing. Our SWAT team is pretty active, um, handling, you know, warrants, and everything from probably about sometimes up to six warrants in a day. So you're moving from basically you know event to event and cycling through these things and then hostage rescues we've done multiple of that um probably about one or two a year on average you know like legitimate hostage rescues where threats unknown to hostages that kind of thing barricaded gunmen sometimes with family members um but about uh seven to eight years in is one right right when 9 11 happens so i knew when 9 11 happened i was going to go on to do other things i actually wanted to get back in the military and drove remember driving my patrol car uh, to the recruiting station <laughs> and i saw i was in uniform and i walked in i'm like hey what what do i got to do to get back in this is right after 9 11 the day after and they're yeah. like we don't even know what's going on right now man. Wow. I was like, this is what i want to do and they're like everything's on hold you know we're trying to figure things out and so um my wife kind of freaked out at that point. She said, you want to do what? <laughs> I, knew, I knew what was going to happen. Yeah. We were going we to invade somewhere. So uh, that didn't work out. Um, you know, it just seemed like, uh, I don't think the Lord, I mean, I know the Lord was just directing that a different direction. And then he, he actually tried um, or looked into SF, uh, the special operations or the Army SF units and stuff like that. And. My thinking was it was going to take too long to get through a pipeline. I thought the war would be over by then, just like, you know, the first, you know, the first Gulf War was over in a few months. I thought right. this was going to be over. So I'm like, man, two years in training to get out the door is way too long. And then opportunities came up to jump on contract work. And um, that's what I did. I ended up working a contract, um, protecting a, one of the heads of state for another uh, country, which opened the door to do some other things within the U.S. government, uh, protecting diplomats, and then that, that worked into some other contracts within government. So for the last 20 years, I've been working government contracts uh, both you know abroad and also in training. So I've bounced into training a few times, various you know, various types of training in various forms uh, for our unit and then back to the field, back and forth a few times. So working in, um, you know, hostile areas, austere environments, um, you know, what would be considered conflict areas or high threat areas of the world. Nice. Nice. I, you, you mentioned uh, the law enforcement time and uh, we kind of talked about it a little bit off camera, but as far as training standards from the time of, when you were in law enforcement to what you see now, mm -hmm. how much has degraded in terms of, you know, vital skills like marksmanship and things of that nature? Well, interestingly enough, um, you know, the, the military, the, the standards really in the military and Marine Corps haven't changed. Um, they may have, you know, tweet been tweaked here and there, especially since my time in. So, so I don't, I can't speak to what the Marine Corps is doing today. 
But when I went into law enforcement, I remember the handgun call. This was 1996. Um, the handgun call very, very, being very simple. It was mm. a very basic call, and I don't think it's changed. It is the state qualification you know, that's required for all officers to pass probably once a year. You know, They have to go through this qualification course. Um, very simple qualification course. No, you know, no, nothing difficult if you're shooting a handgun regularly it's going to be an easy i mean the target literally is the size of grimace you know it's a huge target and um you don't even have like an a zone style ipsic you know a zone style target area for points it's like you just hit this general area you're going to pass the course so all in all the basic law enforcement standards across the board i think you can say this about many agencies around the u.s are very very simple very basic um, but then when I, I migrated over to do other things, even while I was in law enforcement, I ended up working as a department of energy firearms instructor and, uh, kind of fell into that, was selected to do that. And I showed up to training the very first day. This was in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I was, didn't know what to expect. And I, had, and I'm, I'm a guy who shoots, I was shooting regularly, probably once a week, I'd shoot my firearm. They allotted, um, 150 rounds a month for us to shoot. So I'd go shoot that and I'd shoot anybody else's ammo who didn't show up, I'd shoot their ammo. So I was shooting on the regular. So I show up to the DOE course and after signing our paperwork, they took us right out to the range and you had to pass their pistol qualification course, which started at 50 yards, which is sort of, it's unheard of in Florida to shoot at 50 yards with a handgun in law enforcement. Like right. The, so the qualification starts at 25 yards in Florida, but showing up there you're starting at 50 yards and i think we washed more than half the class right off the bat i think we went into the course with like six individuals um one came out of cag he was a cag guy and then we have some other albuquerque police officers and um, some local deputy sheriffs interestingly enough i remember those guys what they carried in their holsters were 1911s and I thought, man, that's really cool because we weren't allowed to carry nights on I think we, uh, at the time we were, I know for sure we were carrying Glock. We migrated over from Berettas to Glock. And, uh, I just thought it was so cool that these guys were running around with these nights on you know, um, high end ones like Wilson combat. Some guys had some cold custom guns that were built by local gunsmith, uh, out of gun site. So these guns, um, were like highly tuned, you know, machines well built. Never saw one hiccup, never had an issue. These guys swore by him, you know. And as I started going back and forth to New Mexico uh, to work with these guys, especially the Albuquerque guys, these guys were in gunfights all the time. Every time I turn on the TV in the morning before I'd go into work on the base, there's a, there was a shooting the night before, you know. And there's an Albuquerque cop getting involved in some type of a shooting with an M4 SWAT. There was, they were smoking people up and right just mm. about every day and so and i and my 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 mindset was these guys are just straight up gunfighters man mm. it's like they're they're uh, shooting it out all the time and that's what they're running around with and i'm like man i wish i could carry a 1911 yeah. you know on duty like that's really cool because la was carrying it you know these guys are carrying it so i did manage to find a workaround funny story at the sheriff's office is like you could carry a 1911 as a backup as uh, long as it was a series 80 you could carry a 1911 so i was like all right i went out and found me a series 80 that uh had it worked on it was solid and a backup gun all you had to do was test fire you didn't have to call with it oh so, perfect here's my workaround <laughs> e26 on the ankle and carry the 1911 on the hip that's what we did so that was that was the workaround nice uh but yeah the standards haven't changed in law enforcement i think it's still the same standards i think um as far as SWAT goes i know for a fact those guys have a higher standard in their their pistol calls and their rifle calls i know for a fact the agency i used to work for has done a lot to improve um just individual like deputy standards for for all this stuff so and i think that's a huge that's a step in the right direction hmm yeah, I mean, whenever we have, you know, in the past, I want to say three to four years, um, out of all the classes that we've taught, um, five NDs occurred on the range. Yep. 
four of those were police officers. Yep. And two of those were SWAT officers, one of them also being a training officer. Mm-hmm. The other one was just a guy who was berating his wife and wouldn't listen to anything and ended up getting kicked off the range. But luckily, he just got a sideburn. But all, all of those, um, it, it kind of reshaped how I viewed the capability of law enforcement in terms of their marksmanship and their weapons handling. Um, you know, you hear it all the time. You got, you know, one suspect shot seven times, 85 rounds discharged. You know, it's like, well, where are all those re- other rounds going? You know, who's accounting for all those bullets? So it's one of those things where I, I think it's not necessarily the the fault of the police officer, you know, having several friends who are in law enforcement and SWAT, but it's the fault of the agencies not allotting time during work hours for that police officer to go to training and to get the training that they need to be proficient. I mean, if you're going to carry a gun every day, you need to be doing a monthly qual or at least a monthly training exercise. Um, you know, and, and it's weird because there are certain aspects where like in the military, if you're doing hostage rescue, you either CAG or somebody else is very specific and they're shooting thousands of rounds constantly. Um, to be able to be professional at that. Um, when it comes to law enforcement, though, they could be put into the same exact scenario with a hostage situation or whatever, a domestic violence, but they're not given that same amount of training. And so I think it's a disservice to the to the officer themselves. And then, but yet, at the end of the day, if they are involved in a shooting, then the, the, the hammer comes down on them for how come you didn't this and how come you didn't that. It's almost like I don't I wish the agencies would would set their officers up for success to be able to um, have the capability to one be un, un, under that stress, mm-hmm. make the right decision. Right. Um, but also being able to be accountable for every single round, not just in the courtroom, but in, on the street, you know. Yep. I think it comes down to not training to a qualification. Yeah. Uh, that's not that the qual should not be your baseline standard. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. Yeah. That's 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 to that's to do your job. Yeah. But they but they tend to qual or practice to that baseline standard too much. Yeah. But I think um just looking back on kind of what changed my perspective on training was the force on force. So we had a group come out at the time and do some training at our facility. And uh, remember Surefire Institute, the original institute back in the day. So it was, it was being run by Ken Good and uh, Vaughn Baker, uh, Mark Warren, some other folks were in there. And Barry, Barry Duke, who's now head of like the suppressor division of Surefire, he was there for a bit. And then he, at that time, when, he, when this group came out, when Surefire came out to us, he was actually migrating over to actually develop the Surefire uh, suppressor program so he was kind of in between but uh, one of the interesting things was you know i they came out and they did a week worth of training it was a low light course and i thought i was getting into a low light course you know and what it was is a force on force course you know they just happened to do it in low light conditions which is additional stress on top of you know the force on force aspect because if you think about it there's no real way to replicate what a gunfight's going to be like, right? Like shots fired, you know, the, the noise, the chaos, there's no way to replicate that on a range. You know, when you're shooting live rounds at a paper target, there's no fear of pain or death, bodily harm. None of that's triggering the sympathetic, sympathetic nervous system, you know, which when that's triggered is when the crazy stuff happens. When people do physically like, crazy things and i remember the first time i was immersed into this i was like what am i like my mind was just all over the place i couldn't concentrate you know and there was so much chaos and i learned a ton just from day one about myself i'm like wow i thought i was ready for an engagement and i just completely i feel like a total idiot right now and i'm being honest and I don't think anybody goes through something like that and doesn't feel the same way. So I'm, I'm going to be 100% honest. It's like, that was a total mess. Like, my performance was horrible. I remember leaving there feeling defeated. You know, like, I'm a good shooter, but what just happened? You right. Know? So by day five, and they recorded, one of the things they did was interesting. <laughs> they recorded everything. So, like, when you went through your 
your evaluate like it wasn't an evaluation the whole course was an evaluation but when you went through your one man one on one basically one man versus one man scenario two on twos and then four on one scenarios basically the one on one was like they set up a field of vehicles and barricades and then you start on one end of the field and your opponent starts on the other end of the field and you basically got to hunt and find each other and whoever gets the first hit wins well if you get hit you rotate off you reload and you come back and you just keep cycling through this and so you start to figure out real quick you know like best angles of approach and that kind of thing and you work in the lights See, this is in conjunction with all the light techniques that you have to learn mm. Um, and then you then you work two on twos, so you work with a partner and you're doing this, and it's just constant repetition. You go, you fail, you do it again, and you're just cycling through this. And this is, you know, a ten hour day course. Um, by day five, you're super calm, you know. And then the scenarios transition from the field to actual structure, and then you're in a structure, clearing a structure with a four man team, and you have opponents or threats inside the building. And you're communicating as calm as can be on the radio, shots fired, hey, threats on my left. I mean, it's so smooth, even though there's chaos. Hmm. Point being is that there has to be a level of stress inoculation that takes place. Uh, marksmanship or validating marksmanship will only take you so far mm -hmm. in a real fight. Um, you've got to get to the point of failure and take the butt chewing, you know, from whoever it is that's running that training and learn and keep going. I still remember the infractions that I made. I still remember, you know, shooting the no shoot, you know, and how that to, to today, even I wait that I still think about and process like, how did I do that? Mm. Why did I do that? And I shot a no shoot, you know? And so that's cool. I learned from it and I just moved on and I understand like kind of where that failure point was. And I think you have to get to that breaking point in training to understand, but you want that breaking point to have it in training. You know, you can't just assume that just because I got a hundred or I score 300 on my qualification test that I'm ready for the, you know, a gunfight on the street or whatever, when you don't know how you're going to react in a real world scenario. And then you add to that where you've got six or seven cops showing up to a vehicle interdiction guy crashes a vehicle after a car chase and then six random officers show up who you've never really trained with are now surrounding a vehicle trying to extract the threat from the vehicle jeez everybody's just dogpiling each other guns are pointed you know at each into, other yeah, yeah into the center of the circle everybody's just standing around and nobody's thinking about backstop and who's going to cover who and what there's no communication going on it's total chaos that's where the you know the mistakes happen you know mm. um and also communication stuff you know so i'll give you one thing that people used to do this on the on the range and it drives me nuts as a firearms instructor i would hear <clears throat> instructors yell the word gun to initiate shooting on the line gun then whatever the drill was stand by gun now you take that officer put him on the street now he's making an approach on a threat vehicle and the partner sees a gun on the center console and he yells gun mm. what do you think is going to happen rounds are going to start flying rounds are going to start flying because this guy's thinking oh it's this is my go time i can shoot this guy because i just heard the word gun meanwhile the other officer sees a gun just in a center console could be a concealed carry yeah. so the communication stuff one of the things i noticed wasn't even there you know, and proper communication. And uh, what are you trying to elicit from the officer or, you know, deputy when you're training them? You know, what type of response, you know, uh, being careful with that kind of thing. So. Mm. That's interesting. I think that's something that, you know, when you bring in the force on force piece, that, you know, or we took that rigor training course and we was a red dot course, but he adds force on force in the back end of it to show how we are reacting and why the red dot is so effective because you maintain target focus. Um, so we actually, Roy and I did this course with Phil from Vigor. If you guys haven't trained Phil, you need to go train with him. But um, one, it was one-on-one. -on -one. one person had a red dot gun. The other person had iron sights. 100% mm -hmm. of the class never used the iron sights. 80% mm. of the class used the red dot 100% of the time. 
And so because it's so, and that was a perfect example to show the effectiveness of the dot, but it was through force on force that you actually could apply it versus just, man, you know, and guys were shocked, like, man, I couldn't find the dot during live fire, but we were putting it into practice and force on force. I could see the dot every time. Yeah, I remember uh, talking talking about uh, the the what Phil put us into for the the first scenario. It's not technically c- scenario based, but it's like okay, corral like yeah. basically back to back, and you know the the go button goes, you know the call goes, and it's there's no there's no barriers, there's no cover, there's no concealment, there's no, absolutely nothing. You're just in a you're just in a circle. It's a hood. It's a hood rat fight. It's a hood rat. Fight. That's <laughs> exactly what it was. It was a hood rat fight. Yeah. And uh, it was me and Eric. And and you think that you're going to come up with a plan. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Whatever your plan is, it just just throw it out the window. Yeah. yeah. Because cause it doesn't matter. All all of your all of your dry fire training, all of your other reps and things like that. Yeah. You know what? That may come into place as far as getting the pistol. You know, drawn out of your concealment, mm-hmm. clean, smooth that repetition where you're not discharging in onto yourself, you know, yep. uh, yes, all that happens, but your, your initial engagement, whatever you thought your plan was going to be, <laughs> just yep. throw it in the garbage because yeah. <laughs> yeah, it goes out the window. So yeah, yeah force on force, man. T- talk about a eye opener. The first time that I went through a force on force mm-hmm. was just, that was a total game changer yep. in my mindset. Mm. Um, Everybody yeah, has a plan, plan, right? Until they get hit in the face. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly right? dude. And it, it doesn't feel good. <laughs> no. I so, think it... Mm, go ahead. I was just going to say, we, I ended up going to work with um, with Ken and those guys and started traveling, doing the road show with those guys all over the U.S. And we had, you know, kind of some of the big names come through the training class, some of the master class shooters of today. I won't even say their name because they're, they're well known and they're, they're actually... Um, pretty famous but it was interesting um to see even with a skill level performance wise once we put them under force on force for the first time how they fell apart wow you know and uh, i was like wow because i remember you know you kind of like wow this guy's so and so he's well known he's a good shooter and there was a little bit of ego you know with this with a lot of these guys but man they're humbled fast mm. that happened to me too you know i think you're you get humbled really quick when you start to when you start to realize, like, man, it's not going to play out the way I thought it was, you know? Yeah. So, um, and then, you know, they, you, you go into the learning process after that. So you, you, your e- ego gets, you know, knocked down a peg or two, and then you go and hopefully you, you stick with it and you just learn from that, you know? So, mm. mm-hmm. As far as, for those who don't know, the Surefire Institute, that was around when it first started. Do you know when that first started or what came out? I know it was, uh, so Ken started in the, I want to say early 90s right? right so he had he left the teams and this is just me kind of knowing his history personally so i don't know the dates exactly but he left the teams and he started combative concepts which was based out of san diego and what he was doing was he was training the navy navy personnel on how to recapture ships and how to fight aboard ships so before you know in that time frame um this this is before simulation. This predates UTM and all that stuff. So they were using Tipman 98 paintball guns, you know, and they had a big hopper on top of these things. And yeah. they would take a Surefire 6P, which was the original, like, light that Surefire came out with, which was like, man, like, you own the night with this thing, right? So <laughs> lumens is what it was. And it was like, man, I, I can get rid of my mag light. Now I've got this, like, little torch in my hand, you know, and it's like, 60 lumens <laughs> so they electrical tape this thing to the to the barrel and that's what you ran with you know um the gun felt nothing like your m4 or mp5 it was what it was you know and you were you went in there and you you just did multiple reps of you know force on force well mr matthews um from surefire came down and he saw what ken was doing and he liked the low light program and ken wrote the doctrine the the low light principles principles of low light Hmm. and he wrote that uh, low light curriculum which a lot of you know um training institutions right now use you know they may have modified you know things here and there the techniques change you know how you hold the light change but the principles of operating on low light uh and using white light came from ken so i give all always give credit to him he was a mentor of mine 
a uh, really good instructor, you know, um, and um, it's really important to kind of know where these things come from. Because, you know, this is, again, before YouTube, and guys are jumping on YouTube talking about things, and the people of today assume that this person invented it, and we have to pay homage. I believe we always have to pay homage to where these things came from. Yeah. You know, these are our professors that taught us what we know. Uh, Gunfighting has been around a very long time, you know. Um, and there are guys that, you know, we need to pay respect to, you know, the Pat Rogers, the, the Ken Goods, these are individuals that, you know, even Jeff Cooper, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't around during those time frames, I was around for his, his life, but, you know, these are people that we have to recognize. There's so many other names um, that were doing it before us. For example, Ken was teaching certain stances that certain groups now talk about and everybody's like oh did you see these guys doing this stance and how they hold the rifle i'm like no man, that stance was being taught back in the day and ken probably got it from somebody else in the upright head up torso upright position you know um lean forward you know aggressively from your knees and keep your hips in line and all that yeah. stuff that was being taught way before these these guys were teaching it they were probably in you know elementary school when ken was doing it so <laughs> Uh, so it's just interesting to me, like, like how certain things are being adopted, like they're shown and like, oh, these guys are teaching this and it's theirs. And you always got to pay homage. I think. Yeah, so. mm, I think that's so true, especially, you know, I think of the, you know, guys that kind of revolutionized gunfighting as an art, which to me, it's it's like a martial art, you know. Um, but I think back, like actually the original, the Barrel and Hatchet logo came from, Mm -hmm. the pirate lore and the reason why it was from the pirates and also the early Minutemen is pirates when you had a flintlock you only got one shot mm -hmm. so what do i do if i want multiple shots i carry multiple guns yep. and so they were revolutionizing at their time ways to be able to fight and then once my flintlocks are gone i'm running mm -hmm. to the hatchet or the yep. tomahawk you know so i'm it was just a constant um fluid motion of being aggressive and being able to revolutionize the equipment that you have at the time and I think that is important to to remember those those old timers that kind of paved the way for the rest of us and what we have now. Um, Love that mindset too. You yeah, know, like never out of the fight. You yeah, know? like they're those were the tools of the day. But they're like, hey, we're gonna work around it. We're limited by these things, but we're gonna make it work. You yeah, know? it's a mindset thing. As far as the uh, from you know you talk about the early surefire with the sixty lumen candle mm -hmm. to now we've got thousands of lumens and <laughs> all kinds of capabilities. What are some things, and Roy, if you have some inputs too, I know you've been in the industry a long time as well. What are some some changes that you've seen in the industry? And then has the industry pretty much stopped innovating and just kind of repeating, rinsing and repeating the same stuff with a different brand and logo? Well, it's, it's funny. You know, we were just talking about this before. Um, handguns, right? Like mm. we were just talking about what's coming out at SHOT Show. Boy, I'm like, and unless the thing starts shooting lasers, we got a gun that shoots laser beams. I mean, really not interested, you know. Like, yeah. I know it works, you know, and I've done the whole, oh, there's a new gun. We try it out, and I go back to what I usually use, you know, and uh, I just always migrate back. I'll buy something new, test it out, right back to what I, I know well. You yeah. Know? And it may not be perfect, you know, um, but it works for me, and uh, I'm pretty good with it. You know, like I've got so many rounds downrange with it that it works for me. So, the industry itself, um, you know, talking about lights, that that's something that's always changing. Technology is year by year is getting better and better. So lights are getting better and better, and so it's like almost like the iPhone, right? It's like, um. I wait a while before I jump on a new light because I'm not going to buy a new light, for example, for another, you know, 50 or 500 lumens or whatever. It's just they're too expensive, you know. Right now, I think Surefire has reached, um, I won't say a pinnacle, but they have really done well with the latest lights, you know, the turbo lights. You know, we're talking at, we're talking about close to 100,000 candela with their new turbo series lights. That's pretty awesome if you think about the range, you know, candela measures throw of white light versus the lumen is total, like total output. So um, that's pretty serious. I'm not messed with mod light only because um, pump initially the battery series, like the way the batteries work for us and, stuff, um, and having to take them abroad and recharge since we're not always capable. It's better to have for us battery operated things um, than it is trying to recharge things you know right. um so 
So yeah, um, the industry itself is interesting. Uh, I, what I've noticed that is that notices that a lot of these companies have kind of fallen prey to social media and influencers, mm. right? And this, you know, this is something um, guys in my world that are, you know, they're legit dudes, you know, and they just can't stomach it, man. And like, we can't watch certain YouTube personalities or certain companies that back YouTube. And there was a while there, there was a trend probably about three or four years ago that a lot of these gun companies were getting with gun bunnies, you know? Yeah. And, and diminishing, yeah. just diminishing really the craft and the profession. It's like, I don't need to see a chick in a bathing suit, like if tacked that, out, you know? That, yeah. yeah it, like tacked out and like she's going to go do an operation to me. It's like, you know, and I, I, I just take this a little bit more serious than yeah. than the joke. You know, yeah. it's not, a, it's not a, for me, it's not a joke. You know, this is a lifestyle. It's yes. craft. Yes. And um, to have a, really a nobody, she might be beautiful, whatever, but it has nothing to do with the guys doing the work, mm. you know, so. I, 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 man, I want to hit on that so hard because <laughs> there is a, I think now it's, there are so many things in the industry that are just trending things. Mm -hmm. Like, why buy this? Because it's trending. Because right. of social media. Because of this. Because of clout oh well i can afford this and if you can't then you know look down upon you yeah. and this whole like trending thing to buy things to buy certain equipment with without any purpose behind it like if you have a, like i mean you know from the military side it's always like have a reason why you're doing something right, right? but now we're buying things because it's trending we're buying things because this person told me to buy it and they're running it um, this, this tier one operator is a cool guy that used to, and he stands behind it, but he doesn't, mm -hmm. you don't ever see him shoot ever anymore. Um, and so I think that we've lost some, I, and hopefully it comes back. And, and I think that it is starting to make a resurgence because now you see more guys like being super into preparedness and super into training and, and training with a team that is becoming now more popular. Right. But, um, yeah, the gun bunny thing, it's, it's, it's no. insane to see how many, how, how ma there's like no women instructors that you see that are like, yeah. all right, just you're a professional, you know what I'm saying? Like, and it's, and it's crazy because I feel like in that realm, there's so many new women gun owners. And I hope that becomes a more positive trend where more women start to take it serious. Yep. And I think that those who do, thank goodness, every, follow their lead, you know? I will we'll say they're, they're out there. Yeah. Uh, I have had the privilege of meeting a couple, my wife and I met, um, if I can use her name, Brittany May. You yes, know, she, I, I love her stuff. Yeah, she's, yeah. she's legitimately a, a great, like, great shooter. Got a chance to see her shoot. Phenomenal shooter. Great um, instructor as well. Mm -hmm. And she takes it seriously. Yeah. So she does have sponsors and things like that. But the problem is, is, like, a lot of these companies are not looking for that. They're looking for the... The other side of the spectrum in the sense of like, yeah. they want the girl that's going to take her clothes off and don't care how she shoots. And it's like, right. I mean, I, I think the industry is now, like you said, they're shifting back. Yes. Different, you know, which is good. But there was a while there. I was like, what is going on? Yeah. You know? um, and, and the messaging is it's just not right. Um, but yeah, so I think, you know, that's just um, people and companies falling prey to social media and going after the likes and that kind of thing. And, and even going after an influencer just because they have the following, the following, it's really not the good, uh, in my opinion, not a good approach. I get why they're doing it. It's just like, you know, because dudes that are actually doing it, you know, they're like, man, this guy's a moron or yeah. this guy. This guy is PNG from our unit, you know, mm -hmm. and he, if you knew who he really was, you probably would never touch him, you know, only you're only using him because of his likes you yeah. know, or, you know, his, his following. So I think that that's something else is like we are going back towards, I think, in a good direction where it's becoming more serious. Mm -hmm. But um, like you were saying about with the whole the whole gun bunny thing, it's, you know, companies going after that marketing in terms of just like, I just need to sell things, right? Versus now we've lost, I hope, I think we're getting it back, you know, with like companies like 100 Concepts or, you know, um, you know, different companies that are developing products based off of an actual need of the shooter. Mm -hmm. But if we, we look at it all the time, whenever we push out information on YouTube, it doesn't get anywhere. There's no traction. There's no viewing on it because people don't want information nowadays. Mm -hmm. 
want. They want entertainment. Yep. Now I'm I'm really hoping that turns where it now becomes more and that's something that we, you know, Roy and I have always talked about is like we want to put out information, good quality information, unbiased information, and make it, yeah, entertaining to watch, easy to watch, but at the same time not become a, a, a jester, you know, becoming a, a, a jester and a clown in the industry just to be able to get the viewing to make more money and all that stuff. Right. It's not a production. Yeah, it's not a production. It's not a production. It's a this is this is an industry or this is a trade or or skill set or craft or whatever that 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 deserves information to be spread properly mm -hmm. uh, to get out. Uh, the the product itself should be sold. If you want to sell product, put product in people's hands that use it. Yes. At the end of the day, yeah. uh, not putting product in someone's hands because because of their of their looks or their or their or necessarily all the time their subscriber count. I mean, I know guys that that I watch on YouTube that that have sub two thousand subscribers. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, and may have two to three hundred views on their YouTube. But they put out a solid amount. They put out solid content yep. because their users are mm. actually out there in the field, yep. you know, testing their product and and finding out what works. You know. Yeah, I think that's something. It could be also just a culture thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we are. It's definitely a culture it, thing. I mean, you have yeah. entire you have entire social media pages now that have been created. You know, there's 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 Facebook pages uh, out there and Facebook groups that uh, where where your ability to comment is based on your scoring and ranking on what you own. Yes. You know, wow. I own yeah. a, you know, I own an SR 15 and yeah. you know, so, so I can, I can comment over you that owns, you know, uh, aero precision, aero, aero 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have an aero precision with a, you know, that's built with a Roscoe manufacturing barrel and all this other kind of stuff like that in it, which is a solid build. You know, you got a LaRue trigger in it and everything, you know, it's a really, we know, as shooters, stable, you know, good, yeah. as shooters, we know that that's a quality build, yep. but, but my level of being able to comment there is because I don't own a, you know, and you know, nothing against Knights Armament, you mm -hmm. know, I love them as far as a company. I own a few Knights Armament, but that doesn't, me owning those Knights Armament rifles, those SR-15s doesn't make me a better shooter. It doesn't make me, doesn't give me the ability to sit at this table mm -hmm. and have this conversation or, or, or my, my level of knowledge isn't based on what I own because, mm -hmm. because I own, you know, six rifles with surefire lights and, mm -hmm. you know, pick 15s on them and stuff like that doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Yeah. If I can't shoot, yeah. if I can't, if I can't back it up, if I can't perform, if I can't put the standard down and actually do it, yeah. that means nothing. No, I agree. And I think it's interesting also because we're seeing people, you know, saying, oh, like, oh, well, that cheap optic isn't worth it. You know, mm -hmm. you know, hollow sun or whatever. I'm just going to call them out. But we're seeing hollow suns in a Ukraine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're seeing them used in down range now whether it's how they're holding up but who knows those things are being utilized right um and i think there is some uh some credibility as far as the brand you know i think that there is importance in buying high quality um but something that roy and i've seen through through barrel and hatchet and this our testing and being shooters ourselves and and constantly having being blessed to be able to put this stuff to the test is is we have found that being brand loyal mm -hmm. will end up biting you in the butt one day because guess what that that company may miss QC mm -hmm. for that one time. Twenty twenty was bad, like we saw it real bad in twenty twenty. Yeah. You know, from companies that you would never expect that type of issue having complete catastrophic failures of their equipment, and it was like, okay, we'll send it back and get another one. It fails again. Send it back and get another one. It fails again. At that at certain points, it's not the you know it was a bad unit. It's something's wrong with your process. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we've always talked about like you as a shooter have to do quality control because once I lose confidence in something, mm -hmm. it, 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 it takes a lot to get that back, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so, w you know, what are your thoughts on as far as like, you know, as a, as a shooter being able to QC your equipment and have you heard of anything or know of instances where a company's product has failed and it has end up been catastrophic? Yeah, I've seen, I mean, we talk about it. I've seen um, aim points fail. Mm -hmm. you know, um, one thing I will say about their customer service, in this case, I had a Micro T1. I think I bought that thing, man, when those things came out. I don't know what year that was. Yeah. It was an old T1. 
that failed, and uh, actually I actually had a couple that failed. I I ended up putting one on a on a on a slide, and um, you just don't do that with a T1. It, it, it was a, one of those Unity slides. Yeah, Unity and, Atom. And it thing lasted maybe 200 rounds, and it died. Wow. Well, I sent it back. Aimpoint fixed it. They sent it back, and uh, no questions asked, no problem. And then uh, I had another T1 just recently <clears throat> that I sent back, and um, they they gave me the RMA number, no charge to send it back. And this is, mind you, like we're in 2023 at this point. I get a package in the mail, and it's a brand new micro T2. Wow. So they replaced it, you know. So there is something to be said for staying with a known company, you know, that that is known for quality, I believe. Mm. Will they have issues? Possibly, yeah. And uh, I've always stuck with, for example, Surefire. Mm -hmm. It's what I've known, you know. Um, I've been asked to try Mod Light, but because of the, like we mentioned, I talked about before, the the way we do kind of our work, we, we couldn't use the recharging system that they had at the time. Now they have something different, you know. So I, I'm not opposed to jumping around and trying different things, but as far as equipment, absolutely, you have to test your equipment. You need to train with it and that kind of thing um i'm at a stage in in life where i have the luxury to own multiple things i could there there was a time especially when i was in law enforcement i never thought i'd own a knight's rifle mm. like, i remember seeing knight's sr25s at the gun show and i'm like man i could never afford that you know now it's and, uh... <laughs> yeah and, and now it's like just as bad you know those rifles are triple the value you know so that very rifle so now I'm in a, in a position where I can own an SR-25, thank God, you know. Um, but is it the only 7.62 gas gun, you know, projectile launcher? No. Are there other great brands out there? Absolutely, yes, you know, that can, can do the same, you know, do the same job. Um, so, yeah, man, I think I think uh, not staying brand loyal because I am not – I have multiple brands. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a bunch of everything, and I'm kind of in the same mindset you are. If I have something that fails – um, I had a scope mount just recently fail me, and it's a well-known scope mount. Mm. Um, we'll never use it. Yeah, I sold it off. Yeah, you know? and um, you know, yeah. talk about. Oh yeah, right? yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I was like, I'm sticking with what I know works, and mm. that's what I'm going to use from now on. You know, and if that fails, I'm looking for something else. Mm. So yeah, I think I mean, but you, you you end up figuring out what your QC is by going out and being a user. Mm -hmm. You got to be a user. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't just rely on our answers and sure. what our experiences are. Like you can use that, but you got to be a user. Yeah, and that's you know uh, we've we don't do many reviews for the most part. I mean, yeah. uh, but but you know we've done a few reviews, but at the same time we've we've sometimes we've come back mm -hmm. with issues with that product at that particular point in time, like where you know hey this thing is freaking fantastic, love it you know, where I've gone out in an optic and bought, you know, outfitted five guns with it because mm -hmm. I was like, this is it. This is the ticket. This is, this has got me sold. It's freaking awesome. It's fantastic. Yep. And then all of a sudden we reach a point in time and they all start dropping like flies. And it's yep. like, you know what? I'm not, it doesn't matter. You know, the, yes, the company itself is fantastic as far as their warranty, their claim, you know, sticking with a well-known company that can, you know, that can get your product back to you and get it fixed and in a timely manner. So you're not down. Um, there's there's a lot of us out you know we we have been blessed with this opportunity now uh to own multiple things yep. so if i got one system that goes down yeah i got another system that it's no big deal to me mm -hmm. but there's a lot of users out there that 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 have one pistol yeah have one rifle mm -hmm. um and and i and i feel for you because you're you're outfitting your stuff you're you're you know you're taking we work hard for our money yeah you know so you're 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 basing it off of you know a youtuber or a social media influencer or something like that that's out there it's like okay yeah these guys use the crap out of their stuff right. let me go buy this and then it fails on you like Dude, how that, uh, you how, how is, it, and, and, and to a certain point in time sometimes it breaks my heart from an aspect yeah. of like you know what dude i recommended that to that guy we, that's why we take it seriously. Yeah, like it's irresponsible. It's irresponsible, in my opinion, to be able to push stuff that people are going to put their families' lives on, that mm -hmm. their their lives and depend on it. And the reason we don't do very many gear reviews, it just takes too darn if long. You, if yeah. you, you take want, months to do it, right. if you want free stuff, mm -hmm. 
start a YouTube channel because <laughs> yeah. everybody in the business will send yeah. you things. Yeah. That's yeah. all there is to it. We spend more time rejecting stuff wow. than yeah. we do accepting things just yeah. for the fact of because it's yeah. like I don't want to put my hands on it because I don't want to put my uh, I don't want to put my reputation or AK my brand mm-hmm. associated along with this. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, or you know what? It's just like uh, I, yeah. I told uh, we were me and Eric were talking the other day. It's like man, I I, I want to. I want to put 5,000 rounds behind a rifle before I put my name behind it. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, because because I feel bad from an aspect of recommending a product to somebody yeah. that, you know, uh, with minimal amount of knowledge. Yeah. You know, I go put, you know, sub 1,000 rounds behind something and, and we, give it a, we give it a two thumbs up mm-hmm. and then someone goes and buys it and, you know, they're breaking bolts or firing pins or smashing out or, you know, yeah. whatever it is, you know. Yeah. We've seen it pretty much every bit of it. We've seen it all. Yeah, yeah. I had a company they reach out. They wanted to offer me some new, just for testing to to give it to show it to the unit and that kind of thing. And it's a new scope mount. I won't talk too much about it because if I describe it, it's uh, it's gonna highlight them, and I don't want to do that. They're good people. But uh, it was to see if we had any interest in it. Man, I mounted the scope. It was kind of complicated, you know, the whole system and everything. And and I go to tighten the bolts down on the side clamp and snap. You know, I crack this thing. I'm like, dude, if I'm going to, like, I'm being careful. If I broke it, guess who's going to, who else is going to break it? You know, yeah. these guys down range or whatever. So, like, I was like, put it back in the box. It has not even seen the range. It didn't even make it off the workbench. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I got to mail it back to those guys. But, yeah, there's a lot of that stuff where I think it's, like, in theory, kind of looks cool but i don't know you know yeah. and, I, and again i don't want to put my name on that you know? yeah and uh just, just because they send it to me it's like yeah, yeah. you're right you you kind of have that you feel like you owe something correct you know at the end of it you know and um not a good thing hey but you know as, as we're talking i'm thinking about this and um i know you're air force but it's a, it's a marine thing it's a marine thing and it says one mind any weapon and i think you know when you're when you're thinking about like building out kit and rifles and if you're watching if you're that guy watching youtube and you think well i need that gadget or i need this man the marine corps is like the redheaded stepchildren of all the branches yes you guys are we get the (laughs) hand-me-downs right and it might be better now but i remember we were excited about getting away from alice gear man we were like getting so the point is is that i think they do a good job instilling a different mindset of like hey man doesn't that that's all hardware stuff Mm -hmm. you know it's the software stuff that needs to be kind of uploaded and that's what you got to keep in mind is like i can take anything and kill you with it you know yeah. i need to you know if, if all i have is a standard you know m16a2 rifle can i get it done with that yeah isn't it sexy no but i can still do the job with it you know yeah. so you're the weapon you know you are the weapon and you need to see yourself like that all this other stuff is like whatever it's yeah. just it's just hardware you know that the uh, industry that the has put too much on it is how sexy is it? Yep. Yes. Yep. How, how sexy, trendy is it? How trendy is it? How sexy is it? So, you know, speaking of mine or uh, excuse me, uh, software, what are some basic tactical things that every citizen should be knowing of? Like, you know, we've seen a video recently of of a uh, certain person saying that hey you need a you know as a citizen you need to focus more on long range because that's more realistic and more ap- applicable i don't know i for, you know we've always talked about depends on your environment and where you're in and what you're going to endure the most but from your perspective what are some baseline skills that you think would be good for every citizen to have a good knowledge in every shooter well obviously handgun right rifle those are your, your two primary medical so getting getting trained up on medical and not just like first aid stuff but kind of TCCC, you know how to deal with trauma gunshot wounds that kind of thing that'll pay dividends uh, well i think um and just in the people that we trained they've been in more medical incidents than they have been in shootings mm. you know where they've been able to help you know other people just because of their training um their medical training so that's something that needs to happen if you're getting into this world and you're getting into this kind of mindset is um that's one of the first priorities of work i think is medical then you can add on you know like you get to a point where you know and i and i know this you your handgun 
And you're like, okay, I'm sh- going to go shoot target again. And it's cool, but I'm kind of bored, you know. And so you start stretching the legs on it, you know. And if you can get to a range where you can stretch, you know, what's, what's considered long distance, you know. I mean, think about it. Like, Florida, you, I talk to the guys like, yeah, we're going to go shoot long range. And he's shooting 250 yards. I'm like, that's not long range, bro. Well, when they're shooting back, it seems really close. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, it's funny. Like, I'm trying to find a range now that uh, JTAC's gone, you know. It's like, yeah, we've got. 500 yards i'm like still not long range no. you know like the mindset of what people consider yeah. long range is yeah. is is you know yeah that's 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 normal engagement distance yeah mm-hmm. so so like i think long range is something that it's a skill that i think uh, i waited until later in my career to get to jump into but it was only because of the environment i was in where i really could stretch into long range and enjoy it and i think um because I, I was offered uh, a sniper position back on my team, and I didn't like it. I mean, I was there for about two weeks. They're gonna, they were going to send me to Carlos Hathcock's uh, school up in Virginia Beach. And uh, I was like, man, you know, uh, we did some, like, training oper- training operations where we were actually uh, on a venue, and I was actually on the bolt gun, you know, just in training right before they sent me out. And I saw the assaulters running into the building, and I'm just like, <laughs> in my head i'm like no this ain't for me man yeah. i want to be in there so i uh, i didn't take that position i actually bowed out you know bow, bowed up out of it and uh, let somebody else go because i was not interested in it at the time yeah. and then i got to to another location and i'm just like in the midwest and i'm shooting long range I'm like, this is awesome because i'm having to think things through and i started to understand it and for me it is a it is a a pleasure to shoot it i enjoy shooting it i like the other things but to me now that in my stage and where i'm at i really enjoy shooting long range i like i like the science behind it and i like all the things i have to do to be good at it you know so um i think it's it's all encompassing you know it's like yeah it's part of that skill set building you know and so the more skill and set you can build in you know, whether it's like maybe shotgun is not something you think about, but maybe you want to learn how to run a pump shotgun. Maybe yeah. that's something that's a good skill to learn and understand it. And um, uh, sub gun, you know, uh, yeah, we can't run around with full auto sub guns, but, you know, we can we can train with short guns like that. And I think, you know, there is a place for those types of weapon systems, you know. So now you start building in all these other weapon systems into your skill set, you know. I think it's those just being well-rounded there's nothing wrong with it edge weapons is another thing mm. you know another skill because a lot of folks don't think about it but the blade is a very dangerous tool you know if you understand how to use it and where to cut and if you don't have to deploy a handgun but you can deploy a blade to defend yourself you're probably gonna be better off in the long run you know it's still using force but you know um you know, shooting somebody and then cutting somebody is a little bit different, you know, or getting somebody off you and creating space, you know. So, like, understanding that or having a way to uh, create space if you are entangled with somebody and getting to a blade and knowing how to use it, you know. And then, um, for example, my wife, she she carries a blade and a pistol, you know. And if she can't carry the pistol, she carries a blade with her in the gym, you know. So... And I would expect nothing less from your wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very She's good. Hispanic, she'll cut you, bro. Yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, you said the term that we always talk about is being well-rounded. Yeah. You know, I think that is such an important thing. And, and kind of go back to what you said about the mindset of the Marine, that mindset is like i can pick up anything and kill you with it yep. right and that's the type of mindset that we should have versus being a one trick pony mm-hmm. um you, what are some things do you like for example do you think that in long range you build those skills of observation you build those skills of whether you should engage a threat whether to disengage you know learning those types of skill sets as well as like do you think cqb what is the most applicable type of like cqb that would be most beneficial to the average citizen yeah, I think we were talking about this a few times, and is it you were asked you you asked me is it you know applicable for civilians, and I, I think it is. Um, the problem with CQB is that you start getting into this whole world of tactics, and um, you talk to uh, Army Ranger, you talk to the SEAL, you talk. It's like religion, man. You start getting into these doctrines, and guys are like, "Oh, it's got to be done this way and this way." And, and one thing I will tell you is like very, and I know this for facts because. Uh, I dealt with this at work. 
very few people have actually done hostage rescue. Mm. Okay. They'll, they'll talk about all the things that they rehearsed, you know, and all the CQB that they ran in a shoe house, but they've not done it real world. And one thing I, I remember thinking when I did this real world, this guy is holding, um, well, I mean, I don't want to get into too deep into the, the, the war story part of it, but he basically had two kids he was holding, two toddlers, twins, and a little girl. She was probably uh, 12 or 13 in the room. And when we went in, guess what he wasn't doing? He wasn't standing in a corner upright waiting for us to shoot him, you know? He was moving around that room with both kids in his arms. And you're like, uh, we didn't train for this. I was expecting you to be here, you know? And it's like, it becomes chaos. There is no point of domination. Guys are all over the place, you know? Who do you shoot? When do you shoot this guy? He's moving around with these kids. And so the point being is that it doesn't really play out the way we train it. It's, you know, it's a template, you know? And so you have to understand certain principles, especially when you're operating with a team, especially under nods, right? You, why is the point of domination there under not? So we, we start getting into all these different things. The important thing to take away is like, if you are doing CQB and civilian, you're likely going to be doing it by yourself, right? Maybe in your house, moving to a loved one in the house, or you could be out and uh, about, maybe you're at the mall and there's an active shooter, you know, you're in a store with your wife. Cause I don't know if many dudes that go to the mall and hang out by themselves unless they're creepers or whatever. But, um, <laughs> Well, I, yeah, I don't do that either. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, like, I, I, trust me, I sit in the parking lot if I have to. I'm like, yeah. go, go in the Target, I'll, whatever. Yeah. You know? um, but anyway, if I'm, the point being is, like, there there are some merits to learning CQB, uh, learning how to mitigate angles, you know, closing out threats, what's a near threat versus an adjacent angle, those types of things. And uh, understanding the best place to put yourself, you know, especially in open areas, you know, so you can mitigate angles. Those are all things you need to understand. You should know, especially as a, as a part of your skill set. Um, and they apply in a, in a commercial building, mall, whatever structure at work. Mm. And they, the same principles apply in, in a, at your home. So learning some basics is good. Not getting wrapped up around how SEAL teams do it and how, yeah. you know, Dev, Dev does it and all this. And, you know, because um, you, you get into these arguments with people and it's like, why? Well, why it's not even in the realm of what you're going to be doing. You don't even have the yeah, infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have cast. You don't have, no. you know, support by fire teams and everything cordoned off. Like, yeah. it's just you. Yeah. And you've got to, and as a solo dude, you know, you're worried about... 360 you've got the job of what an entire team would normally have yeah you know to, to work to deal with so you're doing a lot of work and it's understanding where to position yourself and when do you check six and when do you close out angles and when do you let them go you know so um you know near threat principles and highest probability of threat principles and all these things that you have to manage so so definitely there is merit to learning cqb there is merit to learning long range, you know, um, observation stuff, like we talk about breakdown of society, you know, maybe I just want to get behind glass, you know, and, and look, and maybe the only, you know, high resolution long range glass I have is happens to be attached to my long gun, you know, so whatever, you know, whatever your thought process is, just have a skill set. You don't want to be caught in a situation, I believe, where like, this is the first time I, I'm having to employ my weapon at this distance, you know, and, you know, just pushing the system out as far as you can to see what the capabilities are. You have to know where the failure point is going to be and where, you know, where your system is capable more where it's not. Hmm. As far as, um, do you think that like, um, you know, Brian and I have talked about doing episodes on this, but things that are like skills that could even be used today, but like off-roading skills, driving skills, you know, being able to get out of a austere environment where you're, you know, you're surrounded by, hostile threats and then trying to evade like are those things that you think would be applicable um absolutely i mean i'm talking about like um riot type situation that kind of thing well just like like you <clears throat> say for example like if we had a total collapse you know which in my opinion i think you know that they always say that history happens slowly over time then all of a sudden right mm -hmm. so what happens if that all of a sudden happens in your you know you work 45 minutes away from home you live 40 miles or you work 40 miles away from your house and everything goes down, and now you have to hoof it back home, mm -hmm. 
do you have the skill sets to be able to do that? Even if it takes you multi day, you know, yeah. um, if you have to go off road and you get stuck, can you get your vehicle out? Right. Right. That, that type of stuff. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely feel like the feel craft survival side, side of it, not the company, but just the field craft, you know, understanding like, you know, water, shelter, you know, fire, all those types of things and, right. and, and having survival kits. And that's something that we talk about with, uh, with our lines of equipment that we carry. So <clears throat> something like a survival kit could be carried in a third line, which we'll talk about later. But there's great companies that put out some really cool survival kits, you know, uh, with fire starting, you know, um, gadgets and gizmos and stuff like that. But there's all kinds of ways you can do that. Um, and then sourcing water and that kind of thing. There's some, some things you might want to have at home for that or even in your truck. Um, to be able to like retrieve water, purify water, and that kind of thing. So getting home, you know, that's a part of your getting home, and uh, just thinking through like what you need um, if that situation arises. Like what what's your second line or your go bag going to look like? You know, what do you need to have? Is as you start to see, because a lot of times <clears throat> this stuff doesn't happen like overnight. There's things that build up. Yeah, you know, you you can see it coming. You know, uh, you think about the the riots that happened in mm -hmm. 2020 and shut down like as that stuff was happening i'm thinking yeah i'm gonna have to plus up my go bag a little yeah bit. you know and there was a time when i ran around with a 300 blackout you know in a small uh little cig rattler and a little go bag you know and it was with me as i'm going through day to day you know? yeah so <clears throat> because there's so much stuff going on. i wasn't in i wasn't in the state the, the florida was actually in good condition compared to some of the other areas yeah and so i was in states where they were doing these you know conducting these riots and you just didn't know if one was going to pop up or whatever so <clears throat> so absolutely yes um you know off-roading definitely we i know guys um that i've trained not in the government side but uh in the ngo space that don't know how to change a tire don't know how to drive manual you know don't know how to drive manual <clears throat> don't know how to use if they, you know, uh, they're going to austere environments, don't know how to use a high lift jack or don't know how to recover a vehicle. Okay. What they need to do to, to change the tire, you know, it's, it's incredible, you know? Um, and so we, you know, when we talk about certain things, it's like when you get your vehicle, make sure that the tire, you know, the tire iron, uh, the lug wrench actually matches the lugs overseas, you know? Yeah. So when you go to that little uh, place to rent your vehicle, you know, make sure you got a spare, make sure it's full and make sure that the lug nuts and everything match up with the tools and that kind of thing. And you have a, a way to lift the vehicle. People just drive off a lot, a lot of times and they never check that stuff, you know? So, um, so yeah, absolutely. There's a yes to all of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it's something that, uh, that, that you don't, we, we, in this industry or in this line, or we, we focus on the shooting aspect yeah. so much, which is obviously important. Yep. Okay. Um, that training aspect but uh but also training training to uh other types of scenarios i mean you you talk about the riots and and all the all the roadways that sometimes are completely shut down mm -hmm. you know interstate sections that are completely shut down mm -hmm. um you may need to turn your vehicle around you may need to actually go inside of a median mm -hmm. or something like that turn your vehicle down what do you do when you actually get stuck yep. you know what do you do when you cross that median and you blow out a tire do you know how to change that tire yep. you know uh you're stuck at work and your battery's dead Mm -hmm. You know, do you know how to, do you know how to do that? I mean, mm -hmm. and these are, these are simple, you know, from my world wise goes, these are, these are skill sets that almost seem very simple to me. Yep. Uh, but how many, how many people I run across all the time that don't know how to do that? So how important that is. <clears throat> I had dudes in the Sears school that mm -hmm. had never been, they had raised in the city. They had never experienced a campfire outside. They'd never even, not, not just started one. They'd never been around a campfire yep. ever. And it's just like stuff. It's like, what what planet do you live in? But it's just like, there are things that we take for granted mm -hmm. as skill sets that I think you know take a back seat or don't even pop up into someone's mind. Or a paper map. map. So we had a group of, yeah, we had a group of young. Uh, they were just just out of college and they were getting ready to go into uh, North Africa. And this is a non government related thing. And so we were um, actually in Spain, providing a little bit of training for them before they were going into kind of a high threat area. So we're in Spain running around, and I get, had an exercise for them, and I handed them all paper maps. And it's a tourist map, you know. And I said, hey, find your position on the map. And I totally just uh, assumed 
that you, you could figure, figure it out like, like oh, hard right i'm thinking this is easy, <laughs> never right? assume it's so easy man you know yeah. so they open the map up and they're all confused and i can see like i can see it on their faces that they're stressing out because i'm telling them you need to get from here to here they just don't know how to do it they they're used to going to the phone and doing everything off the phone so and they didn't they didn't know all they had to do was just find two locations and you know kind of vector themselves on the map and everything so i'm like do you see the clock tower? Do you see the bridge you're standing on on the map? Yeah. The clock tower? And then they figured it out and showed them how to orient the map and that kind of thing and, and get to the next position. And I'm thinking, wow, this is so basic. Like, I can make millions just doing basic. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, but, you know, it was um, it was a really good eye-opener for them to see, like, wow, we rely too, way too much on, on technology. Mm. You know, I still have, like, paper maps. I still have... I have a road atlas that goes in my, it's in my forerunner. You see my forerunner. It's in the, I got a Pelican in the back. Um, and that's part of like, if it all crashes, I can still get on, you know, my paper maps and at least navigate, you know, the main roads and everything. And it's the road atlas of all the 50 states. So it's good to have paper maps. It's good to have those types of things on hand. <clears throat> um, I think especially if you, if you go into a complete collapse society and the signs are gone, and the local infrastructure that houses are burned down and features that you're like, oh, yeah, it's right by the McDonald's on the right, you know, and, and that's gone. Mm -hmm. Now you have a paper map to reference the actual road. And also right? knowing just how to use a compass and that yeah. kind of thing. So funny story, I had my wife change the tire on the big rig I have on mm -hmm. Four Runner, you know. So she, she enjoyed it. You know? Nice. Like changed, taking the big tires off and, like, using the, you know, I, don't, I, I got rid of the Hilo jack. I've got this uh, ARB kind of hydraulic thing, so I made mm -hmm. it easy. You know, like teach your wife how to do that stuff too. Yeah. So, yeah. I think it's uh, uh you go going back to the the rental vehicle. Mm -hmm. It's something that honestly, at the end of the day, has never enter, enter, even entered my mind. We, me and Eric, we obviously just recently traveled to uh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we did like a ride share vehicle. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and now I'm thinking, okay, so we're in a Pennsylvania, we're we're in, in PA in a complete area that we know. Absolutely, I've never been to PA. Me neither. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I know nothing about it whatsoever. Uh, and uh, outside of weapons training and uh, medical training and then a medical instructor with us, you know, uh, we would have been relatively very prepared for a gunfight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that, and then he and, could patch and, us and, up and if we got could, shot. It, 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 it could be patched up if we got shot. But at the end of the day, I, I'm thinking here, I never I never once took that took that second to actually go through the vehicle. Mm. That was, a, that was a lesson learned for, for me. Yeah. So I was in um, a Middle Eastern country, and we were riding two vehicle, and we were between uh, OK City and a not so OK City, and we were kind of in between in the desert area, and the vehicle we were in blew a tire. We were all fine. We rolled off to the side, and we were the other vehicle was basically probably about five, ten minutes behind us as we jump out, and we grab the tire iron, and we start to, like, put it on the, the lug i'm like oh this ain't gonna fit you know and so we uh we carried like the five ton jacks in the vehicle strapped down so we put it on the vehicle got cranked and everything we're trying to get this thing off and I'm like it ain't working and I'm like is there another tire iron nope and so whoever had vehicles that time didn't think to check just assumed that these things were all going to be standard and they wow. weren't so luckily the other vehicle pulled up and again we're not in a good spot here so we're on the side of the road they pulled up and they're like yeah we've got one and theirs fit our vehicle so we were able so after that i'm thinking man we got to double check this stuff you know yeah. so now when i go abroad or even when i ch when i get a vehicle from a rental you know in the states i check to make sure everything is in there sometimes i've i've had rentals with no spare tire in mm. back you know because it's under everything and and maybe they used it for something and they never you know put a new one in there so. yeah we talk about it, our, our, our shooter checklist, you know, before yeah. we, before we, you know, before we, you know, either shoot a competition or just our, just our typical normal checklist for our everyday, you know, pistol preparedness mm -hmm. that you kind of go through, uh, just, just naturally creating those little checklists mm -hmm. for you to, you know, check that box. Yeah. Because if we rely on ourselves to actually remember to do that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I'm, Honestly, we like I said, we went through completely through PA that entire time. I couldn't tell you right now if they had a jack in it or not. The Lord blessed <laughs> us with yes. good tires. <laughs> that, so that, that's actually a good caveat into uh, into mindset. You know, I think that I would love to pick your brain about 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 mindset. That you think that men who are warriors and and having that warrior spirit, 
should have, that being one of them, of just, like, not being complacent, right? That was complacency of, like, we didn't, oh, it's, we just figured it's good. We assume that it's mm-hmm. okay. We assume that there's all the tools that we need, but we are not doing the one, being the ones that are being vigilant and checking that stuff. We became complacent. So what are some mindset things that, you know, for you as being a warrior mm-hmm. for most of your adult life, you know, and in that type of profession that you want to be able to gift onto other men who are less listening to the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so interestingly, I, got, I think I'll, I'll just go back and if it's okay, I'll just talk about kind of like the foundation of where, um, God was kind of inserted into my life a little bit. And so I grew up in, um, in a very strict Pentecostal background and I absolutely hated it. You know, my mother and father would drag me to church and it was long hours, crazy church days and stuff like that. And I remember, I remember thinking, man, like, there's just no way I can live up to this because every night they were talking about going to hell. And like, if you did this, you're going to hell. And I'm just like, Oh, you know, like I'm a little kid now, mind you, I'm probably six or seven years old. I didn't have a doubt that God existed. I just thought there's just no way I'm going to live up to this because it was, I was, I was in fear. And, uh, but I also grew up watching all the cool guy stuff, Airwolf, you know, I'm going to date myself, the 18, you know, <laughs> uh, all these really cool shows, man, where I thought, man, I want to be a good guy. You know, I don't want to be a bad guy. I want to be a guy who fights all this bad stuff, you know? So, and I told my mom, hey, I'm going to join the military when I grow up. And she's like, no, oh, you can't join because if you kill somebody, you're going to go to hell. And that's, that was what was instilled in her. And I was like, well, then God and I are at odds because that's what I'm going to do. And so I just kept God at a distance because I thought, man, if I fo- start following God, he's going to make me a pastor or some of these weak dudes in church, you know, or a missionary, which was even worse. You know, I was like, oh, man, I don't definitely want to don't want to be a missionary because I uh, want nothing to do with that. And uh, so I go through high school again. I rec- I know that God exists, you know, and God in his in his um, grace, he he had he had me protected all through my. I look back and I'm like, man, he was doing things in my life and just kind of guiding me along, and put me in a Christian school for one year, you know, and I failed because I hated it and I failed Bible class, so I, I failed it, but I had to memorize Psalm one. And if anything, I, if, if all, of all things, if I got that out of the whole year, it saved my life. So I, I memorized Psalm 1, right? So you guys can look it up. And I was forced to memorize that. But I had memorized other, other Bible verses, and I just turned off to it. But Psalm 1 always resonated with me, right? And so all through life, that was always playing in my, my head, like Psalm 1. So uh, I get through high school, I'm joining the Marine Corps. I, I know that I got to, like, this is a big step. So I join, uh, I ask God, I'm like, is this the right step, you know? And, and I'm praying, you know, and that kind of thing. And God opens the door, you know, I go to the Marine Corps, and I quickly realize it's not where I want to be. Like, I didn't like the micromanagement. I didn't like, there's a lot of aspects of the Marine Corps I love and a lot that I hated. I mean, if you but you would go back now, I'd probably go to a different branch only because I would do what I want to do. Like I could, I could definitely get on the path that I want to get to. There's a reason why there's so many SF dudes that are former Marines, yeah. you know, former active duty, former Air Force guys that are former active because the Marine Corps is the Marine Corps. It's their way and that's it. You don't, there's no career path for guys that want to do certain things. Um, maybe there is, there's guys that have luck and there's guys that don't have luck. So I just, I wanted to move on. So I, point being is that Marine Corps law enforcement and even in law enforcement, I wasn't satisfied. Like I, I was accomplishing my goals and I was climbing this ladder and I was not happy. I was not satisfied with where I was at. My wife even said, what's wrong with you? Like you just made it there and you're looking for the next thing. And I'm like, I didn't understand. So she, she gives me this book at one point. It's called Wild at Heart. You know, John Eldridge wrote it. And I read it. I'm thinking, okay, I get it. I, God designed me to be this way. I understand. You know, like he designed, to be, he designed Adam in the wild, right? And Eve in the garden. And, and Adam is the way he is. And we are the way we are. Our spirits are the way we are. Kind of restless because he's kind of created to be like, created us to be that way we're just we're created to be kind of like that conqueror mindset of doing those things right but again i wasn't i wasn't following god you know 
I was kind of a fan of God, you know, but I wasn't following. So enter in government work and all this other stuff. And, um, uh, I, I'm, I've reached the pinnacle, right? I've reached the top of the ladder. There's no, really no other place, maybe one other place you can go to in the community. But for the most part, guys that want to do something outside the mill, outside of like what they were doing in law enforcement, that's it right there. And then there came a moment when God took it away. And I believe he took it away for a couple of reasons. I was about, if I would have stayed on the path, I would have definitely been a part of a major event that everybody knows about that I would, I would not be here right now. And, and, and I was, I was taken away, that incident happened and I was wanting to get back as bad as I could, you know, to the, to uh, where I was working. And, um, so man, I was in a bad place. My, my wife was like, man, I can't live with you. I don't know what's going on with you. And I was angry, you know, just lost a lot of my buddies, you know, um, uh, felt like I should have been there <clears throat> and I was trying to get back and I was getting no movement, you know, and I was heartbroken and angry and, uh, just in a dark place, man. And so, um, my father sits me down and he's like, you I can restore you. You know, you just have to ask him and you have to seek him. And I'm like, what does that mean? I don't even understand what that means. Seek him. Like, he's like, yeah, start reading the Bible, start talking to him, praying to him. And I'm like, man, I'm just shaking my head. You know, it's another father talk. And so I just remember thinking, man, okay, whatever. So I'll start reading the Bible. So I grab the Bible. I'm like, I don't understand. I've done it in the past. I really don't understand. I'm like, okay, God, if you want, like, just help me out with this to understand what it is you're trying to say. So, so I started reading, man. And the more, the, <laughs> as I read the old Testament, I'm thinking, man, my mom was really wrong. Cause there's a lot of slaying going on in this old Testament. <laughs> Dude, there's straight up killing going on, you know? And I'm like, man, this is cool. You know? So I, I start getting into it, man. And I remember coming across, uh, Joshua chapter five and, uh, in Joshua, the book of Joshua, um, before the battle of Jericho, before they actually, go in and insert into the promised land right they they're pre-battle right he meets a man with a sword right so immediately this piques my interest because the bible describes this individual as not a regular man this is like this is the angel of the lord mm -hmm. coming across and the interaction is interesting because he's not like you know it's not like he's saying hey i'm for you guys he's like joshua asked him hey are you for us or for enemies he's like for neither <laughs> you just take off your sandals where you stand is holy ground and joshua falls to his face to worship him you know in reverence and he's just i'm like thinking that's never happened before you know it, when the when an angel appears they don't take worship you know this individual appears he tells them take off your sandals we are and there's another place where that happened is where god and moses have their interaction and moses has to take off his sandals and god tells him you know where you stand is holy so really my interest is peaked and the lord you know in my mind starts telling me like hey this is who you are danny i create this is who i am and this is who i created you to be like he gave me this understanding it's hard to uh, hard to explain but there was a peace that came upon me and uh and i was I mean, looking at this all wrong i said lord i've been pledging my sword to the wrong thing and see i think as warriors we tend to pledge ourselves to our flag first and that's wrong yeah okay i can tell you 100 percent that's wrong because if we understand our identity in christ then our allegiance is to him first right the nation this nation is not the nation of god okay it's not it's it's the kingdom of heaven that belongs to the lord this is the nation of, of the world right so if we pledge our allegiance, not to say that we can't be patriotic, but we have to understand that our allegiance first is to Christ, you know, and that he's created our identity. We are warriors and we can protect and defend and everything else. But you also have to think about who runs this world, who runs the U.S., you know, and, and, and the, the, those are the things you have to concern yourself with. So if you, if you stay on the, on the mindset of like, I am a follower of Christ versus I heard this recently on on uh, Instagram of all places <laughs> versus a, a fan, you know, when Christ is going one direction on a path, are you following him or you're like, no, nah, I'm going to stay over here and be on this side, you know? So, so it was interesting because 
once I had that moment with the Lord and I actually ma gave my life and like said, okay, Lord, I'm going to follow you, whatever you want. This one, the doors opened. I, I was able to get back to do what I love to do. He opened that door just miraculously, really. Somebody called me and said, do you want to, you want to come back and go to work? Absolutely. Yes. So with that, um, going to mindset, it's so important to understand, like for me, it's like, okay, I might be called upon to protect other people, you know, and that's cool. Like I, I get it. But for me, this is a lifestyle for a lot of us. This is a lifestyle. Um, it's a path we've chosen, you know, um, I'm not an accountant. I'm not anything else. I'm a protector by trade, you know? Um, and so every day I think about that, I think about life or death every day, believe it or not, it sounds morbid, but I do, I think about dying and standing before God mm. all the time. Mm -hmm. you know, I think about, man, like, am I right with you, Lord? You know, like, I, it scares me. I mean, I think we all, we have grace, but I always think about like, are we, am I right with you? You know, and, um, and I was, and I'm, I'm not good at this all the time, but treating people right, you know, trying to be good to people and be helpful and help where I can. I think that's one of the important traits of a warrior is like not to be a, a hard ass that's not our job you know and put off this persona of being hard you know and have big mean tattoos and big beards and stuff like that i think that's that's um that's a facade you know because most a lot of i know a lot of guys that are like that and and really they're just messed up you know and i think um if you keep your identity and you keep your focus on the one true king the one warrior king you know and understand like hey we have to be in alignment with him first and um and then everything else kind of falls into place and we can still be warriors we can still be protectors we can still be willing to use force all those things are okay you know um but keep it under alignment under his alignment you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. under him and keep your allegiance under him and know that you know because i've heard guys i don't want to get on i don't want to talk about it on a podcast but i've heard guys talking about the direction things are going with the world and the u.s and i'm like that's okay first and foremost our allegiance is to the lord you know yeah. don't get wrapped up in all this stuff over here you know um a lot of it's meant to t distract you and if it's going to take you away from what's right in his eyes then it's wrong mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying so be careful with talking about certain things you know yeah you know what i'm, t I'm referencing mm -hmm. you know and be careful with that because all this is going to pass away you know what's on this earth it's written it's going to pass what's to come is him and that's the permanent you know so we have to stay focused on that i don't know if that's <laughs> no 100 percent. yeah but i think that's something that's also you know we we forget especially for those of us who are believers in christ mm -hmm. we forget that he is a warrior at heart it says mm -hmm. he is the leader of the he is the commander of the armies of heaven yes. and he comes when he's coming back he's coming back on a horse with a flaming sword. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like he's not coming, like we have this persona that he's some wimpy dude in a white robe and long hair and a beard and looks like a hippie. And it's like, no, 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 no. Like we, I think we have lost, and this is something I actually uh, just recently read. We have lost, the, the God of the Old Testament and of the Bible is the same God that is here today, mm -hmm. the same God that was in the New Testament. But we've lost that sense of, fear of the Lord, not in a fear like I'm, I'm scared of dying and going to hell, but in the fear in terms of reverence. Like if, you know, George Washington came up from the grave and walked in the room, what type of persona would we have? Right. What type of reverence would I have towards that? Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But when, if God walked into the room, I would be just like in fear and trembling of like, mm -hmm. this is the God of the universe. This is the mm -hmm. creator of all things. This is the commander of the heavens. Yep. And he's in the room with me, you know? And it's one of those things where like, I was reading in um, in the Old Testament recently, and there was this thing where, where Moses is leading Israel, right? Mm -hmm. And there's some guys that were like pretty much starting a coup mm -hmm. and saying like, you're, you're doing things wrong. We're tired of wandering in the wilderness. You let us out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And they got 250 other leaders of other tribes and leaders and stuff like that, got them together to com complain to Moses and Moses is like, what are you guys doing? Like, mm -hmm. first off, we're not in charge. It's God who's in charge. We are just the con. We just we're just broadcasting it to you guys. So when you're rebelling against us, you think that we're 
the ones that we need to be replaced. You're really telling God that he needs to be replaced. Right. So he's like, all right, how about this? Bring in your sacrifices. We'll all do a sacrifice in front of God tomorrow, mm-hmm. and God will accept whatever sacrifice, mm-hmm. and the other ones, well, that right. it'll be death, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so they bring it all in, and um, eventually overnight or whatever happened, these 250 dudes riled up the entire nation mm-hmm. to, to rebel against Moses. And so God, they appear before the tabernacle, and Aaron and Moses, they set up their sacrifices and their altars, and the, these other 250 leaders, they set up their sacrifice and altars, and all the people of Israel surrounding them, right? Mm-hmm. And God, it's what's crazy is it says that he appears to Moses in the form of a cloud mm-hmm. in fire. So God shows up, mm-hmm. right? And he doesn't talk to Israel. He talks specifically to Moses and says, I'm about to destroy these people. <laughs> and can you imagine if you're in that crowd and you're like, holy crap, God just showed up and he's not talking to us, but he's talking about us and he's mm-hmm. saying, I'm going to destroy you. Yep. And Moses falls down and begs God mm-hmm. for the people on the behalf of the people and these other leaders that they were deceived. So quickly God says, okay, I've got this, but get away. Tell mm-hmm. everybody to get away from those people who started the coup get them away from, get away from them. Mm-hmm. So Moses runs and he's like a madman running, trying to get everybody away back up from his tent because these leaders are standing in front of their tents mm-hmm. with all their belongings and all their servants and all their kids and their livestock and everything. And he's like, quick, get away as fast as possible. And as soon as he gets away, Moses can't even finish getting the words out. Mm-hmm. It says that the earth opened up and swallowed those people and it closed back over top of them. So literally, God tells the earth, and the earth literally opens up, swallows all those people who are co-conspirators, their tents, their livestock, literally not a trace of them that they owned or touched is left, and the earth closed back on top of them. And yet we think that God can't handle our problems, and we think that we have better ways to do things than God. That terrifies me, because it's like that's the God, that same God is the same one that we worship, the same one that be, is blasphemed right. daily yep. by people who don't believe in him or people who, you know, in certain movements just mm-hmm. openly mock. And, and you don't see that type of stuff happening in other religions. Right. It only happens for Christianity, and the reason why is because it's the truth. But we have lost that fear and reverence. Think, Think about, about if churches talked about, about Jesus, right? Um as a warrior king mm-hmm. right? or not as they, they talk about him like, Oh, he showed up on the scene as a baby. And as he's a way, genie in the bottle. Yeah. That's the way I've always like grown up. I'm like, Oh, Jesus is a baby. Right. No, but Jesus is, he's the angel of the Lord in the old Testament. Like I didn't understand that in like the whole or interaction between Joshua, that's Christ before he was Christ, you know, that's, and so that's the, where the Lord was, was telling him, he's like, this is who I am. Like, I, I understand you. It's like when I, when I went back to work, my mission was different. Before, my focus was on the mission, like doing that and like going out the door, doing all that stuff. It was so cool, you know, and no God, you know, God second. And then before when God opened, the, after that, when God opened the door to go out, it was like, okay, God, where do you want me to go? Mm. You send me where you want me, and I will talk to anybody anywhere about you. And some of these guys with the backgrounds they have hate religion. And, I, and I've been able to sit down with him. I'm like, you know what? You know who else hates religion? Christ hates religion. You know, that's the whole reason they crucified him, you know, because he challenged the religious folks of the time. And getting guys to understand who Christ is, these, these individuals, the guys I work with, who he is, and the fact is he was, he's been here since the beginning, right? And he came on a suicide mission to save all of us. And yeah, he took some licks for us, and it looks like he was he was kind of a punk, you know. But he did it. He could have he could have walked away. He could have he even said to Pilate, "He goes, I, if I want, I can I can leave here anytime I want." He's like he offered himself, you know, for us. And he so he came on a suicide mission, and he accomplished his mission, was resurrected, you know, and he ascended, you know, and he is our Christ and our our Lord now, you know. And so as warriors. We, we all, all want to live, live, and I say we, I say, but people that have this mindset, we all want to live for something, an apple, a flag, apple pie, whatever it is, and all those things are fading. They, they're going to fade, and there's nothing really to them. 
or they talk about honor, but yet there is no honor in these a lot of these guys because they're sinful, mm-hmm. you know. So a lot of them don't honor family. I know that for a fact, you know, with the way they live their lives. Um, but honor, all these things, all these traits, and all these attributes that we, men seek after, only one person, you know, and only one king ever had that standard, you know, and kept that standard, and that was Christ. <clears throat> All these people that came after, <clears throat> that people try to aspire to be like, whether it was a you know Medal of Honor winner or whatever, you know, people talk about, they're all sinful men. Mm. You know, yeah, yeah, they did great deeds, but only Christ is the one. And so, yeah. Also, you have the other thing you have to be careful with is too is people that say I follow God, and so um, what God do you follow? Mm-hmm. You know, politicians, for example. Oh yeah, I believe in God. Well, what God? Do Beyonce follow? follows God. Yeah. So it, if if a if an individual won't say Jesus Christ, okay, is their king or their or their God, then there's a problem there. Okay. So that's something you have to be watchful for, especially as we start getting further down the road in our history. It's going to be a lot of people being misled. Yeah. Christ is the only way. You know, He is the truth and the life. So it's just interesting, but I think if, if men and women uh, want that path and they want kind of a, um, a true path to that, to, you know, through this life and, and walk this walk and the mindset and everything else is Christ. The other way I've, I've heard it kind of put, which really makes sense, is that, you know, you think about a horse, right? It's a big, powerful animal, right? And how do we control a horse, right? put a bit in its mouth right and so I, I always think of us as that kind of that horse like we have the ability to do all kinds of crazy things we can hurt people kill people whatever we have the skill set but we're under the control like or under the restraint of christ you know and so when christ unleashes us this is when we can do or what we got to do you know and so we have to kind of keep that in mind too like it's we're on you know we we need to Stay focused on him and just like those, what Moses said about the leaders, like, hey, he's in control, you know, we're just, we're just kind of, we got to know our place is what I'm saying. Yeah. You know? I think that's something you, you mentioned that as far as like a warrior and a true, mm-hmm. you know, all the attributes that I had written down, like mm-hmm. let's talk about, you know, honor and that type of stuff that all comes naturally as a side effect mm-hmm. from having Jesus in your life and making him the commander of your life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there who have the skill sets, right? Mm -hmm. But they are the most dishonorable people you ever meet, can't hold a promise, have cheat on their wives, Mm -hmm. never raise their kids. Like, that's not a person that's honorable. That's not a real warrior. Right. That's just a thug, right? But it's Christ and his by his perfect example that one gives us a reason to live, but also gives us a set of morals to live by. And it's those types of people, the people who are believers who one are protectors, Mm -hmm. but are two, when everything falls apart and everything, and there's no rule of law, let's just say that, it's the men like that that stand up to do the right thing. You know what I'm saying? To stand up when no one's watching, to to be there when no one's volunteering, Mm -hmm. right? And it's those types of people, and that's who we have the perfect example to aspire to be, and that is Christ himself. And so I think that is that is as far as mindset, like that's the perfect thing. That is mm-hmm. the answer. Like at the end of the day, there is no testicular fortitude that you can get to, to have the perfect mindset. Mm-hmm. It, it comes through one realizing that Christ is who he is mm-hmm. and he's not just a pushover or a genie in a bottle or just baby Jesus. And I think the church needs to realize who he really is. Mm-hmm. And two, truly letting him be the leader of our lives. You know, I fought him tooth and nail every step of the way and I've, Paid for it through trials and hard times, mm-hmm. but um, I think that that is a great point for a lot of people to listen to, especially you know in preparedness and and you know being an asset to our families and being an asset to everybody around us. We need to seek to be an eternal asset. And I think one thing that made me shy away from him for a long time is I thought he was going to change me. Mm. So I had this love for what I do right now. Like I still like what I do, you know, but now he's the priority. Like before it was the other way around. So I thought he was going to change me and like make me something else completely. And no, he didn't do that. He just opened the doors for me to do more of it. And it was so cool to see like, Oh Lord, all I had to do was just, you know, be willing to follow you, put you first. And all of a sudden the floodgates opened up 
you know he's like no i created you to be the way you are like you everything that's in in you is like i designed you for Mm. you know so he's not going to ever take that desire to protect and be a warrior be a fighter all those things are cool he's the one who created those things not satan Mm. you know we have a desire to do that in such a way that we want to protect people right and you think about that like most of us will never think twice about being somewhere and we see a little child who we don't know who's about to be injured or possibly killed and we will we will shield them with our own bodies Mm -hmm. like we won't even think twice it will just happen because it's ingrained in us we would do that for a random stranger you know and a lot of people won't do that i mean i can't give you a percentage but i can tell you that people aren't hardwired for that yeah it's only a very small segment of society that would be willing to do that um, and if you're in that boat, then guess what? God hardwired you for that. Mm-hmm. You know? That's not from Satan. You know, that's from, that's from the Lord. So it's a cool thing, you know? So, uh, and it's a gift. Mm-hmm. Final question. Mm-hmm. Cause I think it's perfect to end the podcast on this note. Um, for PDWs. So personal defense weapons. From Jesus to PDW. Yeah, from the Lord to the Lord's uh, preferred system. Uh, do you think 300 blackout is the way to go forward or 9 mil subguns? If you had to pick one, which would it be? Um, and if you have unlimited 300 blackout and you can afford it, I don't know, man. It's like one of those things. I have both, so mm-hmm. it's kind of... Um, here's the thing. What's interesting is what are you trying to accomplish, right? So for me, for a PDW, I want the most compact system, right? It's the, the smallest system I can get. And, you know, MP5, APC9K Pro kind of tend to fall into that PDW system for me. Three to blackout, I run Rattlers, um, personal SIG Rattler, and I've got a nine inch, you know, M6 right now. Um, I don't know. I think um, they both have their places. I don't know if I could pick one over the other. Mm. The 220 grain, you know, subsonic hits like a 45. So yeah. what am I getting over a 220 and a 9 mil, you know? Yeah. Now, if I'm going to run supers, supersonic all the time, and my goal is to have that that type of uh, feet per second, you know, reach out and touch somebody, then I'd go blackout. But if I need something just to get off, like a little get off me gun, get from maybe a venue to the vehicle and go somewhere, then I would just prefer a nine mil sub gun or something like that. Mm. Um, and then have something in the vehicle that can reach out and touch you. So like, can you get out and walk around with your, your rattler, you know, or your 300 blackout? A lot of folks are running AR style 300 blackout with maybe a law folder. Is that something that you can port around the city and be, like nonchalant with and blend in with, or no, would uh, you be better suited with a sub gun for day to day walking around the city? Mm. You know, I've seen, I've seen the, the, um, MKE MP5K style guns fit into really tiny Arteryx bags. You know, the, I forgot what the kind of, it's like a backpack that designed to hold the iPad or a laptop. I don't think they make it anymore. I forgot the name of the system, but those little, guns fit in those bags you can sling it across put four mags in there plus a 15 round mag in the gun and you've got enough you know to do whatever you need to do and be be okay walking through the seat with it whereas if you're in some parts of you know the area in downtown or something you've got a backpack on it you stick out you know yeah. and you're trying to hold and, and conceal that so it's all about like what you're trying to conceal you know and get away with you know so um, I, think I think they all have their place. I think it's really important not to get wrapped around those types of things. Um, remember, it's one mind and a weapon. You know, mm-hmm. like if I can make it happen with a sub gun because I train with my sub gun. I know I can make headshots pretty easily. With mm-hmm. it. If you're wearing body armor, you know, I'm probably going to shoot you in the hip, in the chest, and in the face. You know, I'm going to spread them around a little mm-hmm. bit. You know, so. Um, so not getting wrapped around, well, it doesn't defeat armor. And I'm like, well, the Rattler doesn't defeat armor if you use a subsonic. So what's, you know, what's your gain there? You yeah. know, shoot somebody in the face or the hip, you know, if you're going to, if you're going to take the shot, Yeah. you know, and, um, put a lot of rounds in somebody, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, if that's the case, then why are you carrying a nine mil pistol? You know, mm-hmm. so, I mean, do you see, you, you see what I'm saying? So don't get, I, I think you shouldn't get wrapped around too much of that. Just be 
wrapped around how much training you're getting. Amen. You know. Mm. Well, that was that was awesome. (laughs) Very good. Well, if we never even touched touched on go back. I know, dude. We we probably have to do that for a whole other podcast. It's the uh, perfect definition of a PDW. I mean, at the end of the day, like, what what are you actually going to leave with? Mm -hmm. What are you going to carry? We talked about that before we started today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well. Thanks again for coming in, Mike. Um, we'll definitely have to have you back on. We already have, for those who are listening, we already have several other episodes planned and some things in the pipe that uh, we can use Mike's uh, knowledge to help pass on to you. Um, so thank you again for checking out this episode. Uh, make sure you are subscribed to the channel, whether it's YouTube or Spotify. Also check out our behind the scenes stuff on Instagram and as well as don't forget to train. I think the biggest thing, the biggest takeaway I know for a lot of folks is to be going out and getting training. You are the most important investment. You are the asset. It's not about what you have that you bought. It's about you and your skill sets. One mind, many weapons. Um, so make sure you guys go out and train. Check out our training schedule. You can go check out our website for our training schedule on what we have classes coming up. And also sign up for our newsletter for up-to-date information about that schedule. Anyways, guys, thanks again for checking another Habit Cast episode. We'll see you on the next one. Make sure you train to be the asset, not the liability.